You're welcome to First Take on 3FM and TV3. My name is Jifa Bampo. Today we are speaking to the Chief Executive of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwesi Ajiman. Thank you very much, Mr. Ajiman, for speaking to us on TV3 and 3FM. Much appreciated. Thank you, Jifa, for coming. All right. So on Sunday, when the president addressed the nation, he indicated that the uh, creative arts area in terms of easing the restrictions guidelines will have to be set up and engagements done with stakeholders tell us uh, where are we on the president's um, plan in terms of easing restrictions on cinemas and, and pubs and the like all right thank you i think uh, the president's uh, directive was specifically for cinemas and theaters mm -hmm. as we know uh, since covid struck uh, since march 2020 uh, various players in the industry have gone through one form of restriction or the other. Uh, as and when the situation demands, restrictions are either eased or tightened. And so mm -hmm. we had issues where at some point we had events opened and then it had to be tightened up again as the cases went up. But the cinemas have been closed since March 2020. And there has been a clamor for uh, easing the restrictions within that subsector. Oh, we've been engaging with the Ghana Health Service, the Presidential Task Force on COVID and cinema operators, and generally the value chain of film. Uh, we all know that, as the President said, uh, we'll protect lives first before livelihoods. And so given the risk involved in uh, cinema operation, I mean, movie houses, you go in there, people have to take off their mask and uh, drink, Coca-Cola or any... Or they're uh, sitting very close to close each, to each other. other. Taking popcorn and all that. So it was a risk area. Uh, the issue of ventilation, uh, you know, because of the sound effect and all that, most cinema houses don't even have any windows at all. They are enclosed. Closed. And so that also provided a risk factor. So we've been knocking on the doors, working with the operators in and out. Every, almost every week we have meetings to see what sort of... Uh, protocols can be put in place so that restrictions can be eased uh, so people can at least get their livelihoods back on track. And so that sort of engagement has been ongoing together with uh, the two key players, uh, Dr. Nsian Sari and uh, Dr. Samoaba of the Presidential uh, Task Force team. Uh, they've been leading that discussions. We've met with operators. We've uh, worked with them on some set of guidelines that we believe if we can all follow through, then it's probably will be time to have some of the restrictions eased. Like I indicated, there are risk factors. I mean, if you take a place like uh, the normal market, it's ventilated. And so in as much as it may be crowded uh, because of the way it is and looking at uh, the incident rates that we've had in the country, is normally not come from people out and about. It's more to do with people uh, grouping together in a public gathering, especially in an enclosed area. And so we have had series of engagements and I think uh, the president has given directives for us to try and bring the engagements to an end and put in place the guidelines that will enable uh, the sector to be opened up. And so that is where we are. So uh, how long will it take uh, to get the guidelines in place? As a matter of fact, we've worked on a set of guidelines, but there are other stakeholders in the game that we need to engage. It's not just the cinema operators. You have the Ghana Medical Association, you have other players. Everybody is a key stakeholder. The enforcement agencies, because once... The security agencies. The security agencies. Like, so you can put in place the guidelines. How do we enforce them? How do we police them? And so then you have to engage with the security uh, agencies to ensure that they also understand so that they don't go to a cinema operation and say, why are you doing this? So they, they are also educated on the guidelines. So as of last week, I think Thursday, we had a meeting uh, with the operators. They came, we engaged. They even came out with certain protocol that they felt ought to be added. Uh, we've also gone around to some of the establishments to see what they have uh, on ground. I mean, in terms of, for example, if you ask if each cinema to provide a sanitation station, um, are they ready? I mean, uh, what is the state of readiness of the operators to abide by 
those protocols. So all these things are in place and I'm hopeful that uh, by the end of uh, the week we should be able to come up with a, a, a clear path or the different milestones that they have to meet to operate. But um, we want to thank the President at least for granting us this concession at this point in time because uh, these operators, it's not just the cinema houses, the entire value chain. So mm -hmm. you have those who are producing films, uh, the actors, the actresses, the script writers, the light men, the people who have been prov providing food on sets for uh, And those who come to the cinema, the who operate the cinemas, the cinemas taxis, those who sell, all right. The popcorn, and it, it's a massive uh, industry, and so we are, we are grateful for the concessions that have been granted. But I believe that as we have engaged with the operators, we can all work within the protocols that are coming to ensure that uh, a time will come when we will have to go back and close it up again. How many cinemas and theatres are we talking about? Okay, um, we have, I think, five major uh, cinema houses. Uh, but then there are a lot of theatres and event centres that, in a way, also serve as cinema houses for people who are premiering their movies. So you have issues of people coming up with a movie and deciding to, let's say, premiere across the country. Uh, if you go to Tamale, for example, there is no fixed cinema house, but they will go to, let's say, UDS and rent out the auditorium mm -hmm. to screen a movie. And so all these uh, areas are being looked at. Uh, what sort of protocols do we have to put in place so that if somebody goes to the University of Ghana and says, I want to rent out the Great Hall to show a movie, uh, it's not a cinema house. But then at that point, they will be acting as one. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that they also abide by the protocols that have been put in place? So, yes, we have five key ones, uh, one in Kumasi, the, uh, the Kumasi Mall, and four in Accra. Uh, but I believe we will be engaging also with all the other theaters and other event centers that sometimes allow premieres to happen in their premises. How much money has been lost to cinemas and theaters? Do you have, can you put your, can uh, the authority put a, I, a, I, an I wouldn't be able to, I mean, but what we know that, uh, like I indicated, um, they have been non-operational since March 2020. And so jobs have been lost. Um, the data that we have is not exhaustive enough because for a very long time, these cinemas were not uh, areas that, uh, yes, we we regulate them, but they, I mean, there were no issues. So I think COVID has taught us that, I mean, we, there are certain things that probably uh, ought to be looked at in terms of um, expansion of uh, the mandate of the authority itself. And so that you can at least know how much they are bringing in, how okay, much... So, for example, if you ask me the same thing for the hotels, and, you know, because we have the manpower data, we have so much data on them, um, but we didn't seem to have that sort of data on uh, the cinema operators and also the various centers that... Uh, but, like we all know, COVID has been uh, wrecking... Uh, have work on everybody. I mean, every business has suffered, and I know they have also suffered. Mm. In talk about uh, businesses suffering in the creative arts industry, for instance, I was reading a UN report which said it may take Ghana another year almost for the industry to recover. Um, government has um, announced tax reliefs on corporate income tax uh, to a level of 30%, a waiver on penalties and interest on accumulated tax. I have heard colleagues in the creative arts industry saying this is not enough, that to start with, you need to work to generate the income to benefit from this 30% waiver. Then there were monies that were allocated to be distributed. They, some of them have said they didn't get anything. What is your authority doing to provide support to the teaming numbers of uh, creative arts industry uh, people? All right, I will say, Jifa, that one year is probably <laughs> a, bit, a bit optimistic in my view. I mean, given what we know, and given that we don't even know when this is going to end. So it's not like we are out of the woods yet. 
Um, you know the story of India with uh, the, the new uh, strain that has come up and then the waves that are happening all over. Uh, we are also a bit optimistic because at least the vaccinations have started and we've seen a gradual reduction in incident rates. So we are cautiously optimistic. And so if we were to be able to bring back the industry to pre-COVID era in a year, then I would say thank you, Jesus. But if you look at the scenarios we are dealing with, uh, it doesn't look like we will get there within a year. I mean, being uh, quite frank with what we are seeing. What the, kind of time frame do you think I, may I, be realistic so that I, operators I, in the sector also can pace themselves? I think, for example, uh, let me just put some scenarios together for you. For example, if you look at our international arrivals, uh, we moved from about 1.13 million in 2019 to 355,000 in 2020. So that is like a 68% drop. Now, the question is, okay, if COVID disappears today, do you get back to 1.1? The answer is no. Why? Because a lot of the connectivity uh, instruments, the flights and all those things, are no, are no longer coming in. I mean, for example, South African Airways, which was a big carrier for us out of uh, the United States and from Southern Africa. It's not flying the route anymore. So that takes away a chunk. Uh, the bigger airlines that were doing uh, daily flights have reduced to three times a week, uh, five at the most. And so all of a sudden, how do people even get to the country? Access is not there, connectivity is not there. And so to get to that level again, there are so many interplays that are not within our means now. I mean, we don't have control. So unless, for example, KLM decides that, okay, I'm reverting back to my daily flight, uh, Air France is doing that, uh, South African Airways is back, British Airways is doing that, more airlines are coming in. Um, we've seen Qatar Airways come in. This is good news. Last week, United started on the DC uh, routes, which is good news. But then, like I, I'm saying, you need connectivity, you need access. And we and need the land borders to open, open as well, so, so example, that our West African borders, borders can burn. So okay. all these things have to be in place. And I don't think, realistically, uh, these airlines are going to be reverting to... Uh, the, the way things were where, two years ago. Yeah, within uh, six months. Okay. And so I will probably say within two years, we will probably be in a better shape than we, we are now, but probably not even to pre-COVID areas. And, uh, and that is why for us, domestic and sub-regional tourism has become a key uh, strategy for us going forward. I mean, we realized that uh, even when we were doing the year of return, Nigeria was still number two in terms of arrivals for us. Uh, Nigeria is a big market, uh, big population, uh, and they love Ghana. And so if you look at the fact that you have people like Davido, Wizkid, and Ben, they almost always here, some have homes here. That really is uh, a platform that we can build on. So domestic tourism, not just for those of us in country, but from our West African uh, no, so citizens, I said domestic, is a new frontier? Domestic and sub-regional. Okay. So for domestic for us living here, and then sub-regional. For example, domestic, we have a basket of... Uh, tourist sites that we monitor. Uh, in 2019, there too, we did about 640,000, 669,000, sorry, arrivals to the various tourist sites. So you talk about Kakum, you talk about Shai, you talk about Mole, you talk about uh, uh, Lake Pusum Train, you have uh, uh, Kintampo. We put all of them in a basket. So we monitor year on and 669,000 uh, people visited, will visited, visited and, uh, as of 2019. Yes, mm -hmm. and out of this, about 70 or so percent were locals. So it tells you that people, Ghanaians, were... Do you know what the year-on visit uh, numbers look like for last year and this year? Yeah, last year we dropped to uh, below 300,000. So about 240-something. So that's a huge drop. So now to get it back to 600,000, We've looked at it, okay, what are the opportunities there? One opportunity is that we realized that a lot of people who were also traveling out cannot travel. So a lot of Ghanaians who used to go for vacations in Dubai 
uh, in uh, South Africa and the rest, they may not also be able to go. So then there's an opportunity for us to market to them. Now, people have complained about pricing, that some of our hotels are too expensive and for a thousand dollars, somebody might get um, uh, a full uh, treat in Dubai versus if you took that thousand dollars to, let's say, uh, Kumasi, probably three nights is, is finished. So what we have done is to engage the industry players, the Ghana Hotels Association, the Progressive Hotels Association, uh, the tour operators uh, association, and the rest of them under the Ghana Tourism Federation. And they've all agreed that they are going to offer discounts so that they can put together wholesale packages. So if you wanted to do a five night stay, for example, in Cape Coast, Takradi, it now becomes affordable to most people and also they have added on packages that make it more attractive for you to want to travel to these destinations. So our target is within the next 18 months, try to bring it back to the 669 and then by 2024 move to a million. So that's the target we've set for ourselves. Uh, the idea is to get back to the 600,000 uh, for the year 2022 uh, and then also uh, for sub-regional. Uh, go back to around 250,000. And so uh, we are looking at a strategy for not just Nigeria, our Francophone um, brothers and sisters. How do we bring them in? I mean, if you look at, for example, uh, the Volta region, we have an opportunity to bring in a lot of uh, visitors from Togo. Uh, if you go uh, to the Western region, uh, Maha, and the rest, you have people, I mean, normally we see a trend of people coming in from Cote d'Ivoire to some of the tourist sites we have in Zulezu and in that area. And we want to be aggressive about it. And so these are things that we are doing to really bring the industry back on its feet. And then so when it comes to issues of tax rebates, issues of support and stimulus, uh, we're quite excited. I mean, in the next few weeks as well, uh, there will be another wave of COVID uh, relief by the, under the ministry, the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, uh, the Ghana Tourism Development Project will be announcing a new wave of uh, COVID stimulus to support uh, the SMEs within the sector. Uh, that will be in addition to what the MBSSI uh, will be doing. And uh, we know that the first wave when NBSSI opened up, a lot of people within the industry uh, did get some support. But like Oliver Twist, we want more because not everybody got it. And so we've gotten the feedback that people applied, didn't get it, and they are all in the queue. And so we've been talking to MBSSI, and thankfully the new wave that is coming will probably uh, reach everybody. So this uh, additional COVID stimulus you're working with MBSSI on, is there a time frame for start? Uh, or, or roll out? Oh, I believe within two weeks. Actually, the, the initial timeline was somewhere this week, but I believe there are some preparatory works that have been done. Uh, MBSSI, this is under the Ghana Tourism Development Project, but MBSSI is the uh, implementing uh, partner, you know, so they will review the applications because they already have the systems in place. They did a COVID stimulus for government, so you have the infrastructure that will be able to support the applications, the review, and then, but this is specific to players within the tourism and hospitality uh, value chain. How one, much are we, how much are we projecting? In terms of? Disbursement or the support? I, I believe we're looking at about $5 million uh, for that. So that's about close to 30 million uh, cities. Uh, in the earlier 600 million that was uh, put out by MBSSI, that was for every SME. But even then, we were able to um, reach some compromise with them that they, they take a look at the associations within the industry. So we had grouped associations, let's say Choba, uh, Operators Association. Uh, so this uh, is specifically for... This is specific for tourism. Tourism, yes. good. All right. And uh, hopefully by June, this will be rolled out because oh, yes, we yes. are in the middle of yeah, May yeah. already. All yeah. right. Now, you talked about the numbers of travel dropping from 1.13 million air travel 
yeah. to some 355,000. Yeah. The year of return in 2019 was such a blast. Yeah. And many were looking forward to the next campaign, which is beyond return. Obviously, we've not been able to do much in regard to that. Is that still on the cards, looking at the picture you paint about the challenges we have about reviving the industry, the concerns about the third wave, the impact on, on international travel? I think, uh, as uh, Providence will have it, um, Beyond the Return is a 10-year project, 2020-2030. And so, clearly, I think uh, we needed time, honestly, because when we were setting out on the year of return, we, didn't, we hadn't planned a 10-year project. We saw the opportunity of 400 years after the first enslaved African arriving in the U.S. as an opportunity to position Ghana as a Pan-African hub that we really are given the history of Osage for through the ages, pan affairs by uh, Rollins to uh, the Joseph project by Jake and everything that was going on. And so we were more like taking advantage of a situation. Then we started with a year of return. So when we're going through the motions of the year of return, we hadn't planned the 10 year outreach. We started somewhere in the middle of uh, 2019, looking at, okay, how do we sustain this? How do we build on this for the future? And that's where the beyond the return came. And so in as much as we, we had started, we knew it was going to be a slow start because we had seven pillars that we had to deal with. And there are certain things that the diaspora, African diaspora were asking of us. People were saying, look, we, you say we, are, we should come, but it's so difficult coming to your country. We have to go through a, an elaborate uh, visa process. We have to queue up at the embassy. We have to mail our passports. And so the issue of a diaspora pathway to Ghana became a pillar. How do we ease restriction, uh, visa acquisition for our brothers and sisters who want to come back? And it was more like uh, chewing gum and running at the same time. So we're, 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 we're implementing, but at the same time, uh, planning at the same time. And so COVID, as unfortunate as it is, uh, gave us opportunity to now slow down and say, look, how do we put these pillars on a stronger foundation so that it can last the 10 years? And so, yes, uh, people may not have seen a lot of activity, but yes, we have put in place the pillars and the foundation that will make the 10 year project very successful. So if you talk about the pillars, you have like the invest in Ghana pillar, for example. What were people coming to invest in? We have laws that needed to be looked at. So uh, we, we gave us an opportunity to sit with GIPC, the Minister of Finance himself announced the Sankofa investment product that's is now being rolled out. It's an effort to try and consolidate, consolidate and coordinate and, make sure and harmonize the all the activities so that yeah. relate to all of yes. this. So beyond the return, I would say it's still there. The part of the returns that people see is when the experience Ghana pillar, which talks about events. So uh, last year, even uh, during COVID, when the restrictions were eased a bit, you saw what happened in December. A lot of people came to Ghana. There were a few... Uh, parties that unfortunately uh, then we saw a COVID uh, spike, spike the uh, following yeah, year. Yeah, so I think we are we are we are we are oh, we are mindful we are about mindful how about you implement the next the next the next opening. But okay. I believe it's in it's still in process. In the recent budget, the finance minister indicated that the AJ Anama uh, paragliding had been uh, seen a facelift. There's the construction of the Tafe Atome Monkey Sanctuary. I would like to go to the National Museum, which is located um, near, right here in near the Workers' College. But it's been closed. Yeah. Why? And it seems to have taken so long. The same with the Science Museum. It's not been completed. All right. So it's been closed for some time. I think uh, um, it's out on contract. I believe there have been some delays on the part of the contractor. Uh, my understanding was that there were... Uh, the scope uh, got... Uh, there was scope creep. <laughs> 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 uh, 
So I think there was scope creep in the work, so the there was some delay. Delay. All so, right. Uh, but I believe um, we are very close to it being completed. I um, mean, you know that is under the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board, mm -hmm. a sister agency under the ministry. We've been engaging with them, and we are hopeful that uh, by the end of this year, that place will be open and more facilities. It's the same with the Science Museum. Uh, but I believe you can. There are other museums that are open. Uh, the whole museum, for example, has been renovated within the last few years. That is going to be opened, I think, next week. Uh, Cape Coast is there. Elmina is there. Uh, there's Fort St. Antonio in Azim is also there. There are a few that you can travel to. So, yes, the National Gallery is a big asset for the ministry. I believe that it complements what we have at the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Park. Uh, the Osu Castle also was handed over by the president to the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board to also start um, operating it as a, a facility for tourists. And so what we are looking to do is to work with these other agencies to ensure that all these products are ready. In the Experience Ghana, Share Ghana project that we, we are about to embark on, we'll have a focus on city tours. I mean, for Accra, people come for conferences, they come for, and there's no avenue for you to do a proper city tour. Like you, you sit in the London Red Bus, bus tour. Yeah. So you see you see a bus coming up very soon where people can hop in and do a tour. Uh, we have some bone shakers that are also complement. So people want to reminisce and go back to the good old days of our bone shaker days. You can hop into a bone shaker and then do a city tour. So all these things are being uh, put in place, coming up to ensure that people can really enjoy uh, tourism in Ghana. And um, I know that we have these forests and parks. So, for instance, I know the Dija, uh, you know, uh, park, park uh, the yeah. Dija National Park. I've been there myself quite some years back. But there's also the Tiwa Forest. Is there any plan to convert these into tourist attractions, for instance? All right. So, these are already tra tourist attractions. Uh, for example, and the, uh, the reserves. Uh, so you start from Ankasa, you go to uh, Shai, Mole, um, and the rest are under the Forestry Commission. Uh, they've given out a lot of uh, concessions to private sector operators to uh, complement the, the attractions that we have. So if you go to, for example, Mole, now you have the Zena Lodge, which is one of the uh, nicest and uh, uh, coolest places to be in Ghana and then so you can go there have a, a good um, um, treats for yourself and your family and then explore the elephants the other animals in the park and same thing is happening in Shai where now some tents have come started coming up and so the whole idea for these uh, national forest parks is to start bringing in some development to uh, complement the natural things that they have there. We are on a wave of collaboration with other agencies under the ministry and also partner agencies like the Forestry Commission and other uh, key players that are willing to invest. Um, not to take you back, but you talked about the next wave of COVID support that's coming through MBSSI. Um, I need to ask, how can colleagues in the creative art industry, or specifically for tourism, uh, apply for this? All right, so that's why I talked about the infrastructure mm -hmm. in place. So uh, MBSSI, which is now, I think, GEA, um, has a, a platform which they use for their COVID um, relief and COVID support programs. But we've asked them to design one specifically for this one so that people don't get confused. So that is the reason why there's been a delay. So that infrastructure is going to be put in place. And once it's done, we are going to make that big announcement that people can apply. The modalities have been uh, made much, much easier. So any final words, sir? I will say um, to our operators, uh, I know we've gone through rough times together. Uh, it's been a tough period for all of us. But like our president always says, let's protect lives before we look at the livelihoods. Now, with vaccinations going on, we are quite hopeful and cautiously uh, uh, optimistic that we will be out of the woods very soon. Let's all put in our efforts to make sure that we can make Ghana tourism great.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jiman, and much appreciated for speaking to us on First Take. Thank you, Jifa. And you've been watching First Take on 3FM and TV3. My name is Jifa Bampo. We've been speaking with the Chief Executive of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwesi Ajiman.